Well, it's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here at Princeton again after a three or four year uh, absence. And it's particularly a great pleasure tonight because uh, Princeton, as it happens, is the last stop um, on my uh, nine and a half week lecture uh, tour following the publication of Reason and the Balance. I've been at uh, many of the uh, universities, uh, the largest universities in this country, and uh, 10 days in Spain at three different universities, uh, living out of a suitcase uh, the whole time. I just have to finish up here and then go to uh, Washington for a uh, national public radio broadcast on Monday, and then finally uh, I'll be back at home in sunny California. So I'm, I'm really glad to be with you for a while. <laughs> now, you know, if, if we ask the, the, the question about can science know the mind of God, uh, what everybody's going to think about right away, in fact, what you're meant to think about, is one of the surprise best-selling books of all time. A Brief History of Time by the physicist Stephen Hawking of Cambridge University in England. Uh, Stephen Hawking, of course, is now known everywhere around the world uh, as the uh, brilliant scientist who tragically, as a young man, uh, became progressively crippled with what Americans call Lou Gehrig's disease and has uh, ended up as, a, as an individual who is physically as helpless as it's possible to be, unable to move. Uh, not only confined to a wheelchair, but unable to speak or to communicate, as most people do, although due to a, a technological marvel and the l very limited amount of movement uh, he has left in his uh, hands, he can um, uh, activate a voice synthesizer, which speaks with an artificial uh, a voice uh, for him. Um, now, uh, his, he wrote this uh, book for the public about his physical theories, a brief history of time, uh, frankly, for money-making purposes. He needed to earn some money to pay his children's tuition. He didn't expect to make very much money. The initial printing was 5,000 copies. But within a few years, this book had sold 5 million copies. Uh, and uh, he uh, ended up uh, a worldwide celebrity on the cover of Newsweek with the caption, Master of the Universe. And one can see the tremendous imaginative appeal. Uh, Hawking is, of course, a, a brilliant scientist, and that's part of the appeal, but the public uh, can understand directly only a very little uh, part of the science. In fact, many people have suggested that A Brief History of Time is one of the most unread bestsellers uh, of all time. Uh, but the very idea that a person in such a state of complete physical helplessness would possibly promise to discover the ultimate secrets of the universe, to make sense out of things altogether. This is a tremendously appealing idea, an enactment of the human spirit and mind overcoming material deficiencies of mind uh, uh, over matter. And indeed, uh, Hawking offered his readers uh, a tremendously exhilarating promise of universal understanding. In terms of the physics, uh, what he promised was that, he said, physics is on the verge of discovering the final theory, as some call it, the theory of everything, as others call it, the complete unified theory of the fundamental forces of physics. And because of the philosophy that he adopts, this theory, uh, the theory of how the forces of electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear force, and gravity were unified at the earliest moment of the Big Bang would be a theory of everything that has happened since. Why? Because, well, if you assume that the universe started with material particles and impersonal laws, and if you knew the state of the particles, and if you knew the nature of the laws, then since nothing has entered the universe afterwards, nothing has happened that wasn't present already in those laws and those particles at the beginning, you would have, in principle, and these are Hawking's own words, a complete understanding of the events around us and of our existence. That is, that physics offered, he said, the possibility of a complete understanding of everything, the events around us and of our own existence. The first big step towards this goal was to be a unified theory of the four fundamental forces of nature. Once that unified theory was discovered, Hawking said, 
it will be possible to teach philosophers and then even ordinary people something of what the theory means. Eventually, this knowledge would then enable everyone to take part in a great conversation about such grand questions as why it is that we in the universe exist. Why is there something instead of nothing? And finding the answer to that riddle of existence, Hawking concluded in the very famous final sentences of his book, would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we would know the mind of God. Now, what Hawking was talking about when he said, then we would know the mind of God, was not, at least as, as it appears in the context of the book, the God uh, that uh, people uh, think of as the God of the Bible, the God of the Judeo-Christian tradition, a supernatural being outside of nature who created it. Rather, what Hawking seemed to have in mind was that through the pursuit of scientific knowledge, human beings would take on God's omniscience. You see, they would know everything that there is to be known. Uh, a, they would have a complete understanding of the events around us and of our own existence. Now, um, if you take uh, even the most uh, a modest, a skeptical stance uh, towards this picture, you can see at once that there are some things about it which are strikingly unlikely to be fulfilled. Uh, for one thing, uh, particle physics, the kind of thing that Hawking does, is absolutely unintelligible to people other than specialists in the fields. One has to have a very advanced mathematical knowledge to know what they're talking about, and yet he, without explaining, held out the promise that if the particle physicists found their goal, they could somehow explain it to philosophers and then to everybody else. It could become common knowledge, you see. It would become part of the common knowledge of everyone. And more than that, he seemed to think that this knowledge of physical events, of physical cause and effects, could cross the barrier between the how questions, how do things happen, to the why questions. Once we had a perfect knowledge of how things happened, we would know the why. And it's with knowing the why, you see, that we understand the mind of God. Does it seem like a very naive vision? Well, yes, in fact, it really is. And uh, uh, that's why it, 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 it's so interesting that this very naive, romantic, and impossible vision of what scientific investigation could provide created this tremendous worldwide stir, you see. It was a kind of imaginative fiction that uh, captured the public mind because, as that Newsweek cover story said, it promised that we could become the masters of the universe, you see, that, that uh, this scientific knowledge of material cause and effect could give us what people seek, a way of making sense out of reality as a whole and coming to master it. Now, um, the naive optimism, the naive rationalism of that view of what scientific knowledge could provide is very much at odds with what we hear from uh, some more sophisticated voices in the academic world. One of these that I'll just use as an all-purpose example at this point is Richard Rorty, the famous philosopher who was a professor at this university, I believe, at an earlier stage in his career, but is now at the University of Virginia, uh, who is a leading proponent of a view of the world which does not take this same uh, a hopeful stance that we can understand reality as it really is, and we can have a complete understanding of the events around us and of our own existence. In fact, in a recent article, um, uh, uh, Rorty says that one of the firm conclusions of contemporary philosophy is that it is impossible to imagine that we could through investigation and thinking, achieve what he calls a full, objective, true account of nature, of things as they really are. You see, this is in his wording, the same thing that Hawking is saying when he says a complete understanding of the events around us and of our own existence. Why couldn't we have this complete understanding of nature, this complete unified understanding which would be true for everybody? Well, Rorty says, it's because of the very process of scientific investigation to which Hawking appeals. What do we get out of scientific investigation? If we take the scientific investigation of our times as the true account of reality, as Rorty does, what does it tell us? Well, he says, the, it tells us that we are the products of Darwinian evolution, of evolution by 
mutation and natural selection of material processes that rewarded only success in reproducing and in leaving offspring. And, to quote Rorty's words, the idea that one species of organism is, unlike all the others, oriented not just towards its own increased prosperity, but towards truth with a capital T, is as undarwinian as the idea that every human being has a built-in moral compass, a conscience, that tells us intuitively the difference between right and wrong. You see, so that the very idea that science gives us about ourselves, that what we are is a species that evolved to its present condition through natural selection, a process which rewards only success in, in leaving offspring, uh, makes it impossible to conceive that this one animal species should have an orientation towards absolute truth instead of uh, towards its own increased uh, prosperity. It's as absurd, he said, as the idea that we have an intuitive knowledge of right and wrong. Now, um, that notion, um, the way he put that, struck a particular chord in me because, as you know, as you've been told, I'm a professor of law in my regular academic work and a professor of criminal law. And one of the things I know about our legal system is that it presumes that every individual has an intuitive, innate understanding of a difference between right and wrong, between moral right and moral wrong, a moral right and moral wrong that exists independently of the legal system. And that is why the definition of insanity for legal purposes, the insanity that will make you not liable to a criminal conviction, is that you've lost that understanding. A person is in insane if due to mental disease or defect, he or she is unable to understand the moral wrongfulness of the act. Uh, but this view, which is so uh, uh, central to our system of, of uh, criminal responsibility, is to Rorty uh, inconceivable that it could actually be true that we ha would have a sense of an objective right or wrong just as it is inconceivable that we would have an orientation to finding absolute truth, a complete understanding of our world, uh, because all we can really know is what works for us in our particular uh, condition uh, in time. So um, uh, the very understanding of science that Stephen Hawking appealed to, to suggest we could come to some universal knowledge, uh, turns out to call the whole prospect of universal knowledge into question. Now, if you want to see that development uh, in its uh, perhaps a f fullest flower, that uh, notion that a true scientific un uh, understanding of the world destroys rather than furthers the notion that there is a rationality to the world as a whole, you won't have to go any further than the current issue of Scientific American which features an article by Richard Dawkins, the most prominent advocate of Darwinism in our time, an article taken from his latest book, which is called River Out of Eden. Uh, and the article is titled God's Utility Function. Um, the subtitle, the summary of the article is right under the title, says, states the message of the article. It says, humans have always wondered about the meaning of life. According to Richard Dawkins, Life has no higher purpose than to perpetuate the survival of DNA. Uh, and in this article, Richard Dawkins uh, explains his very well-known view of the Darwinian process, that it, the Darwinian process is a process um, which, uh, once life has started in the first place, is a process of selecting and rewarding those genes, those stretches of genetic material of DNA which are better than other stretches of material D, uh, of DNA at leaving copies of themselves. And that the whole process of life is just a process of DNA trying to make more DNA. Now, what's the meaning of this process? Well, one of the things that Richard Dawkins says is that if you even ask that question, a question about the meaning of life, the question you see that Richard, that uh, um, uh, Stephen Hawking I wanted to ask, you're scientifically illiterate. And he concludes the article by saying, so long as DNA is passed on, it does not matter who or what gets hurt in the process. Genes don't care about suffering because they don't care about anything. 
in a universe of electrons, the electrons are the stuff that Stephen Hawking studies, in a universe of electrons and selfish genes, the stuff that evolutionary biologists study, in a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces, and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, or any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but pitiless indifference. DNA neither cares nor knows. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. So now here is the fulfillment of the, prop, of the promise of rationality, you see, that was going to come from scientific investigation. What do we get? We get a world of material forces existing to produce more material forces, of DNA producing more DNA, and that's all there is to it. A meaningless, purposeless, completely irrational world. DNA neither knows nor cares. That's the true underlying nature of reality. Now, how do we get to this point? It seems like this effort to understand the mind of God turns out to have the conclusion that God has no mind. There's no mind there to be found. Now, how did this happen? Well, um, you know, I, I was lecturing just the other night at another university, the University of Delaware, um, and a professor of molecular biology who was objecting to the uh, message he understood I would be delivering, came to the lecture and passed out copies of an article that uh, uh, he thought would refute everything that I said. Now, I was delighted to see this. I knew the article. It was something that was already familiar to me, and I thought, goodness, what a wonderful illustration this gives of just my point. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so I'll use it here tonight with you as well. Uh, the uh, essay is from the Journal of Molecular Evolution, and it's by a very prominent and distinguished molecular biologist at UCLA, the University of California at Los Angeles, named Richard Dickerson. Uh, the essay is titled, The Game of Science. And I can tell you that it was written um, with me particularly in mind, because it, it uh, was published in this journal uh, just a while after they had uh, uh, opened their pages to me to write an essay, you see. And so, although though he doesn't name me in it, there are references in it which uh, clearly indicate that it's, it's written in, um, uh, in part to uh, answer uh, what I had said. Now, he begins this essay, The Game of Science, with the following statement. Science fundamentally is a game. It is a game with one overriding and defining rule. Rule number one. This is the overriding and defining rule of science. Let us see how far and to what extent we can explain the behavior of the physical and material universe in terms of purely physical and material causes without invoking the supernatural. I'll read that to you again. This is rule number one that defines the scientific game. Let us see how far and to what extent we can explain the behavior of the physical and material universe in terms of purely physical and material causes without invoking the supernatural. Now, right away, it occurs to me that it's rather an interesting rule number one for scientific investigation. Uh, notice that rule number one is not, let's be sure we report the evidence accurately. Or let's be sure that we don't go beyond the evidence to claim more than we really know from scientific investigation. In fact, uh, nowhere in the body of the essay are any rules of that kind suggested or even mentioned. Um, the entire body of the essay is consistent with this beginning point. The purpose of science is to go as far as we can in explaining reality without invoking the supernatural, in explaining reality in terms of purely physical and material causes. Moreover, uh, Professor Dickerson, Dickerson goes on in this article, which, I th which was much celebrated at the time and I think is, is indeed represents a very dominant way of thinking among uh, scientists of his kind, to say that um, while it may be true that we do not at present have a materialist explanation for every aspect of reality, 
The process of seeking such investigations, the success of science has been such that we have reason for confidence that eventually this scientific enterprise will succeed in providing materialist explanations uh, for the things for which such explanations are at present temporarily lacking. And that the worst thing that science can possibly do is indulge even for a moment uh, the idea that there may be some things which cannot be explained in that way. Indeed, uh, Dickerson says, and I'll quote his exact, exact sentence, the most insidious evil of supernatural creationism, the most insidious evil of supernatural creationism is that it stifles curiosity and therefore blunts the intellect. Insidious evil of suggesting that there may not be a materialistic explanation for everything, you see, uh, uh, creates a discouragement towards those who are determined to find those explanations. Now, um, um, if, of course, one has a single-minded view, as Professor Dickerson does, that the whole intellectual process of understanding reality is a process which must inherently presume the existence of a materialist explanation for everything, and that while it may recognize temporary setbacks and checks, has an absolute confidence that it will succeed in the long run in filling out that prospect, then one has a, 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 an outlook which guarantees a materialistic understanding of everything. And since matter has no purposes, matter has no sense of right and wrong, matter has no morality, one gets inevitably out of such a thinking process if it's not checked by something else. You see, if there's not something else that is working in another way, um, what Richard Dawkins told us we get, a world of pitiless, indifferent, unknowing, purposeless mechanisms, and that's all that there is to it. When I reread this Dickerson uh, essay, uh, as I was uh, discussing it with that audience at uh, the University of Delaware, um, I was reminded of something I remember from my youth when John F. Kennedy was president and when the chief of staff of the Air Force was a rather bellicose general named Curtis LeMay. You remember Curtis LeMay? Um, LeMay was famous in the Air Force because he was so tremendously effective at carrying out missions. He was a very, very able officer. But he was also famous for being a, a loose cannon on the deck of the ship of state. Uh, I remember uh, his uh, very subtle answer to what we should do about Vietna the Vietnam War. It was to bomb them back into the Stone Age. And this was the kind of answer that LeMay seemed to have to every sort of problem. Um, and I remember that uh, President Kennedy, when asked about why he kept uh, General LeMay around, said, well, you know, if you decide to go with the bombers, um, you absolutely want LeMay to be leading the first wing and in command. But if you're discussing whether or not to go with the bombers, he's the last person you want in the room to deal with that question. And uh, uh, it seems to me that, in effect, what Richard Dickerson says is that the operational people, the LeMays, who are good at finding solutions of a particular kind, should be deciding what kind of solutions we should look for, that the, the, uh, the bomber pilots uh, should be um, in the State Department uh, deciding how to how to meet the overall uh, questions uh, uh, of uh, reality. Um, and of course, they'll always say of a, that, that, that every problem can be met with the kind of solution uh, that we know. Now, this, this same materialistic imperialism, one say, this, this sense that science looks for materialist explanations, therefore everyone should look for materialist explanations, and um, uh, therefore, um, uh, 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 we, we should assume for all purposes that matter is all that there is and that we live in this unknowing, uncomprehending, meaningless world of material descriptions is very well um, expressed in a current book by the philosopher of science Daniel Dennett uh, called uh, Darwin's uh, Dangerous uh, Idea, um, a, a book which I've recently reviewed uh, in uh, the October issue of the New Criterion. And I think uh, uh, Daniel Dennett explains what is the crucial scientific step in this materialistic understanding of reality, the crucial scientific proposition that gives people like Richard Dawkins uh, the sense that the right way to understand reality as a whole um, is to understand it in strictly materialistic and Darwinian terms. 
What Dennett says that Darwin accomplished, and indeed he gets his science from Dawkins and, and from the other leading figures of Darwinism, is that Darwin explained design in living organisms in materialist terms. Uh, Richard Dawkins begins his famous book, The Blind Watchmaker, by saying that biology is the study of complex things that look as if they were designed by a creator for a purpose. Uh, but uh, they were not designed by a creator for a purpose, he says. They were produced by material mechanisms. And Dennett builds on this theme and says that if it's true that our materialist biology of today can take things like the eye, the um, heart, the brain, uh, the um, different complex organs of plants and animals, and explain all of these things that look like complicated mechanisms that must have been designed by an intelligent creator, and explain them as the products of a purely material process, then we have good reason, having conquered that great problem, to suppose that all other things um, will yield to that same type of explanation, and that a scientific uh, a materialist explanation of everything is at hand, or is at least a reasonable prospect for the future. Um, and uh, here I'll give you uh, uh, Dennett's uh, exact uh, words. He says, Darwin's idea that design in biology uh, could be explained by mutation and natural selection was born as an answer to questions in biology, but it threatened to leak out, offering answers, welcome or not, to questions in cosmology, going in one direction, back to the ultimate beginning, the Big Bang that Stephen Hawking studies, and psychology, going in the other direction, the human mind. Explain that in terms of similar material forces. If the cause of apparent design in biology could be a mindless process of evolution, why couldn't the evolutionary process itself in biology be the product of mindless evolution and so, so on all the way down to the ultimate beginning? And if mindless evolution could account for the breathtakingly clever artifacts of the biosphere, how could the products of our own real minds be exempt from an evolutionary explanation? Darwin's idea thus threatened to spread all the way up, dissolving the illusion of our own authorship, our own divine spark of creativity and understanding. So you see, the idea of a materialist explanation of design and biology by spreading all the way down and all the way up ends up by explaining our own minds as the product of purely material forces, natural selection, mutation, and d dissolves the idea of our own spark, divine spark of creativity and understanding, and thus, as Richard Rorty pointed out to us, the notion that we could be oriented towards absolute truth. What we think is just the product of these material forces. Or as Richard Dawkins put it, DNA neither knows nor cares, and we dance to its music. So rationality itself is dissolved. And yet, although rationality itself is dissolved by this system, the system is presented by its adherents as being the only possible rational system. And indeed, in the words of Richard Dawkins, if you meet someone who doubts evolution in this sense, it is absolutely safe to say that they are ignorant, superstitious, or even wicked. Uh, he says, but he'd rather not consider that. And Daniel Dennett addresses the following statement to parents who presume to teach their children anything other than that human beings are the product of evolution by natural selection. I'll quote his exact words. If you insist on teaching your children falsehoods, that the earth is flat, that man, in quotes, that man, quote, quote, is not a product of evolution by natural selection, then you must expect at the very least, at the very least, that those of us who have freedom of speech will feel free to describe your teachings as the spreading of falsehoods and will attempt to demonstrate this to your children at our earliest opportunity. Our future well-being, the well-being of all of us on the planet, depends upon the education of our descendants. And so we find in this great democracy dedicated to freedom of expression and freedom of thought 
um, the thought that, of course, it's exactly the same thing that occurred to the scientific materialists of the Soviet Union. If you doubt our system, you're insane. And we will take your children from you and teach them the truth. Um, and we will treat you as the completely irrational creatures uh, that you are. Now, what is so ironic about this whole system is that like its Marxist counterpart, um, it's the Darwinian version of scientific materialism, this totalitarian scientific materialism, is founded at bottom on a rather simple misunderstanding. The, the claim, the essential claim, is that the material processes of mutation and selection have explained how we get complicated things like hearts and livers and uh, wings and eyes and hearing systems and immune systems and, and photosynthesis mechanisms and all of those things. But if you ask for an example of this system in operation, ask for an example of seeing natural selection actually doing something creative, you'll get one of three or four uh, different examples uh, that show something very different. You will be told, well, that it is known that there is a species of peppered moth that has some dark moths and has some light moths. And the light moths are better adapted for surviving under some conditions. And the dark moths are better adapted for surviving in, under other conditions. If the trees are light, the light moths are better camouflaged. If the trees are dark, the dark moths are better camouflaged. And so depending on the background color of the trees, you may have a predominance of lighter dark, dark moths in the population. You may be told um, that, there, um, uh, that the beaks of finches vary in size and that large beaks are better adapted for some conditions and smaller beaks are better adapted for other conditions, depending on the plentifulness and size of the seeds that are available for eating. And the average size of beaks in a finch population may be larger or smaller, depending upon those conditions. Um, with respect to human beings, you may be told that there is a mutant form of a gene which causes anemia. Uh, the notorious sickle cell anemia that affects Africans and African Americans in a very fatal debilitating condition. But that this condition, precisely because it thins the blood, can be adaptive in conditions of high malaria infection and can provide an advantage to survival, actually, um, in, in, in the conditions that are faced by uh, uh, populations that are subject to uh, recurrent uh, malarial infections. Now, all of this is perfectly true. I've just about summarized uh, you know, the, uh, all of the textbook examples now of Darwinian evolution in action, and they're perfectly accurate. They're perfectly um, uh, true as far as they go. The question is, what do they explain? Let's see, and, and what they explain, of course, is how in a population which has variation, you can find that one kind of variant will be adaptive under some circumstances and another in others. What it doesn't explain what Darwinian theory doesn't explain at all is where you get the genetic information, the complex instructions um, they, that make biological systems operate all together, that in fact create the complex organs of plants and animals in the first place. Uh, all of these examples simply show variation within types already uh, in existence. But because they are adaptive, and be, because the, the variations in the size of the beaks of finches are adaptive, and because the beaks and every other organ of finches can be described as adaptations, the Darwinian claim is that we've explained adaptation, thus we've explained everything complex in biology, and thus we have made the giant step, which allows us to claim a materialist explanation of everything. And to say uh, to those who do not accept it that we will give you no standing in the world of ideas, and we will forcibly educate and indoctrinate your children in this materialist philosophy by calling it the fact of evolution, the fact of natural selection as our true creator. Well, it's not surprising that this very unscientific, um, this very ideologically laden philosophy is beginning to get um, a, a popular uh, revolt. In fact, has been getting a popular revolt for some time. Uh, what is new in this popular revolt is that the revolt is beginning to find a message, is beginning to find a language which can get a hearing in the world of ideas uh, and in the legal world. Just last week, 
um, last Thursday, uh, the Alabama State Board of Education uh, passed a resolution uh, stating um, a text which will now have to be pasted on the inside cover of every biological textbook that is sold in that state. And the Alabama State uh, Resolution, um, which I'll summarize for you briefly, says essentially that high school students who are reading the evolutionary biology textbook should be aware that what they are getting presented as fact is in fact a controversial theory that some scientists present as a scientific explanation for the origin of living things such as plants, animals, and humans. And that they should be aware when they hear the word evolution that this word is used in very different senses and that the shifting uses of this word can be extremely misleading. The, te the resolution says, as I said, this will be printed as a kind of a truth in advertising label in every textbook in Alabama, <laughs> that evolution refer may refer to many types of change. Evolution describes changes that may occur within a species, and here it cites the peppered moth example of the shifting ratios of dark and light moths. It says this process is microevolution, which can be observed and described as fact. Evolution may also refer to the change of one living thing to another, such as reptiles into birds. This process is called macroevolution, and it has not been observed and should be considered a theory. Um, I'm not sure that they chose the right word in saying it hasn't been observed, can't be demonstrated, and should be considered a theory. I think what they probably wanted to say is that it should be considered a speculation. I think that probably would have been a better word. Evolution also refers to the unproven belief that random, undirected for forces produced a world of living things. And we see indeed, and for example, in that article that I quoted to you from Richard Dawkins in The Scientific American, that um, uh, Dawkins, as well, by the way, as just about every other leading figure in Darwinian evolution who addresses the public, has said that evolution means materialism and that it means that we live in a purposeless world, a world which is the product of unintelligent, purposeless material forces. The Alabama State School Board a statement goes on to point out certain problems in the fossil record uh, which the textbooks do not address. And it points them out and says students should be aware of them and should be aware um, that the textbooks are not, in fact, telling them the full truth uh, about the evidentiary problems uh, that uh, uh, are involved with this theory, and it brings to the attention of the students of the state the information problem. It says, how did you and all living things come to possess such a complete and complex set of instructions for building a living body? So that's the information problem. Where's the program? Where's the complexity coming from that m enables an organism that is a product of many different uh, mechanisms that are all intricate and complex and all have to work together. How is the origin of that explained by the variations in the peppered moth? The resolution concludes, study hard and keep an open mind. Someday you may contribute to the theories of how living things appeared on Earth. Well, isn't this a remarkable situation? Um, we have here a State Board of Education warning the students, um, uh, putting a kind of label that you might, you know, put on cigarette advertising or whatever, you know, to say, don't necessarily believe everything you're told in this book is fact. But the person who sent me this resolution said, I confidently predict that the American Civil Liberties Union will bring a lawsuit to prevent this from being put in the books. Now, actually, I have a higher opinion of the American Civil Liberties U the Union than that. I predict they won't bring that lawsuit, but I don't really know. I think there'll be a serious debate. But wouldn't that be ironic if they did? If the Civil Liberties Union said, you can't tell people to keep an open mind? <laughs> Not on this subject. On any other, they can keep an open mind. But on this subject, they have to accept what authority tells them, because author the authority is science. Now. You know, at the bottom, what the people of Alabama who elected those um, uh, representatives uh, who, are, who are producing this uh, a textbook resolution are trying to do is the same thing that Stephen Hawking is trying to do. They're trying to make sense out of the world. You see, they're trying to understand how things fit together. 
Their interest really isn't in the details of biology or of scientific investigation. I know what they're interested in. They're interested in morality. How does the world make moral sense? Stephen Hawking's interested in that too. I know that he is. And we're all interested in it. We think about, you know, what, what sense does a life make like his? A life that's, you know, been, been uh, uh, characterized by so much physical suffering. Uh, how does it eventually have meaning? Richard Dawkins would say there is no meaning. It's his philosophy, of course, that, 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 that discourages thought, that does what, what Richard Dickerson said uh, a creationism does. It, it stifles curiosity. It prevents us from asking questions. What's the meaning of a life like that? What's the meaning of our lives? How can we make sense out of a world in which there's suffering? How can we understand the difference between right and wrong? How can we understand that postulate that I told you that our legal system instinctively makes and never even questions that people have an understanding of right and wrong? And when they do wrong, they know that they're doing wrong. Richard Rorty says that doesn't make any sense in a Darwinian world. And it doesn't make any sense in a Darwinian world, but is that because the Darwinian explanation of life itself doesn't make sense? It ends us in a picture of irrationality. Well, consider what might be offered as an alternative view of the basis for rationality, the foundation of rational thought. That behind the world that we live in, there is not matter in mindless motion, not meaningless combinations of matter, not just genes striving to produce more genes, but a mind that the world is the product of mind. Now, if we want to make sense out of the world, isn't that the best starting point? And if we want to understand how human beings can be searchers after objective truth, is it not best to understand them as beings who are produced by a mind, who are created in the image of a mind, which is itself the source of absolute truth, the source of objective truth? Um, if we want to understand how human beings can have an understanding, an instinctive understanding that there's a difference between right and wrong, does it not make sense to imagine that there is a difference between right and wrong? Uh, and that um, uh, that is what they are reflecting uh, in this understanding. In short, if we want a rational world, if we want to try to make sense out of the world, isn't it right that we should assume that one can make sense out of the world, not simply as a product of material causes and effects, but of something that comes from mind, that comes from a mind that makes sense, uh, a mind which we can possibly uh, have some uh, a basis for understanding in part, and that that is the basis for which we have hope, that a program of rationality has some hope for success. In short, if we want to know the mind of God, should we not start by assuming that God has a mind, rather than that the end of that quest is a product of materialist, purposeless forces that we will believe in, even if the evidence doesn't show that those purposeless material forces can do any creating. The path to the mind of God is through the mind and not through the matter. And that is my thesis uh, for tonight. Well, um, that's the end of the uh, lecture. We're now going to have a brief announcement from our sponsor, and then we'll get to the purpose of this whole enterprise, which is the question period. You've spoken a lot so far on uh, your, your uh, ideas about evolution. I was wondering if maybe uh, you could uh, talk a little bit about your views on the Big Bang Theory and um, whether it's in conflict with creationist theory or is possibly a mechanism um, of God in creation. Um, and also maybe some of your views on uh, uh, theories of the future of the universe, maybe like the Big Crunch or the heat death or something like that. Mm. Well, I'm honored that you should ask my opinion on these questions. Uh, what do I think of the Big Bang, and uh, um, uh, what do uh, I think of the future of the universe? Um, um, you know, sort of like, how do I evaluate the goodness of God, or something like that? Um, um, but uh, because, indeed, I do not set myself up as an all-purpose uh, guru, a uh, fountain of wisdom on all topics. I've made an effort to study the evolutionary biology, 
um, and a master of the literature of that because it is so directly related to this materialist understanding of reality. And I certainly have a much sketchier knowledge of these other subjects that, uh, that you're uh, asking about. Nonetheless, I will hazard a view um, uh, for what it's worth. Um, I, I love the Big Bang um, for the same reason that so many physicists hated it. You know, it's a creation event. And, and much of Hawking's book, by the way, is an effort to get around that, to say that you know, we can have the Big Bang and we can get away from the creation event uh, because materialist science dislikes the idea that the universe had a beginning. So for theists, it's sort of congenial. Um, on the other hand, I'm well aware it's a kind of a funny situation, it seems to me. It kind of amuses me when I read the continuing stories in the paper about how, um, you know, there, there, there's the universal background radiation, there's the uh, uh, Hubble effect and, and, and so on, which supports the Big Bang cosmology if you make extrapolations, you know, of, of a certain kind. On the other hand, I, I, am, I am faintly amused when a theory is presented as absolute fact and we're told that it, it involves the assumption that over 90% of the matter in the universe is undetectable. Um, you know, uh, um, does it really exist? Um, uh, uh, who knows? Or, or when we're told that the current calculations make uh, certain stars in the universe older than the universe as a whole. You know, so, so obviously there's some, you know, there, there's, depending on what you give emphasis to, it, 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 the present state of knowledge can look absolutely secure or it can look like things are pretty much in flux. So what I tend, what I, the way I tend to just approach these questions, I tend to take seriously a point that an awful lot of people in science give lip service to, but I don't think that they really mean it, which is that scientific knowledge at any given time is tentative. You know, the, 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 the Big Bang cosmology is, is certainly, I'm, I'm very eager to concede, and, you know, to affirm that it's an undoubtedly the best interpretation of physical reality that we have today. But if you said, am I certain that that's still going to be the orthodoxy a century from now, you know, I'd say no, it wouldn't surprise me terribly if things went in a different direction, if things uh, were different. And it, it's for that reason that I am not, you know, uh, interested in the way a lot of people are of unifying science and religion, you know, of having uh, the religious version of the theory of everything that some people would do to say, you know, this is how everything is and this is how it fits together with a religious consciousness or with the Bible or whatever. My, my own sense is that probably we know less at any given time than we think we do. Our, our knowledge from scientific investigation, even good scientific investigation, not Darwinism, which is a, in my mind a pseudoscience, but even really good scientific investigation is apt to be tentative and it may be subject to change and, you know, we should, we should wear it lightly. I wouldn't bet my soul on it. You see, and I, and I wouldn't try to prove God from science because I'm more certain that God exists than I am that you know, current scientific theories are absolutely true. So, you know, that's my kind of, kind of take on it, which, you know, you can, you know, take or leave for the, whatever value you find in it. The next uh, question, please. Hi, we've talked briefly on like chemistry and physics and various issues in microevolution. Um, I was curious on the macroevolutionary sense, uh, when we deal with archeology span and geology, how, how can you refute the supposedly physical evidence of um, like ar archeopteryx and the various series of prehistoric men, et cetera? Oh, well, that's the easiest thing in the world. Um, uh, uh, and uh, for those who want the answer in any detail, um, it's in chapters of four, five, and six of, uh, of Darwin on trial, where I go into the fossil evidence. But uh, let, let me just you know, tell you this, that um, uh, if, if you look at the fossil evidence overall, it is by all, the strongest reason for not believing in Darwinism. Um, uh, at the time that The Origin of Species was first uh, published in 1859, Darwin's leading opponents were not clergymen. They were not Bible-thumping pastors. They were fossil experts who said this theory just can't possibly be true because the overwhelming pattern in the fossil record is that while you know, new things seem to appear from time to time in rocks dated in different ages, they always appear fully formed and just as they are, and they stay unchanged. Persistence of stasis, absence of evolutionary change is the rule of the fossil record. Now then over the succeeding years, the, the Darwinists said a year after, you know, well, we're going to find the transitionals, we're going to find the evidence, the fossil record is incomplete, we're going to, you know, fill in the evidence that the Darwinian theory must be there. Darwin himself wrote, by the way, he said, I never would have realized how incomplete the fossil record was until I realized that it doesn't show any of the transitional forms my theory requires to have existed. Think about that. 
See, it, it never occurred to him to say that that indicates there's something wrong with my theory. That indicates there's something wrong with the fossil record. And that was the view that paleontologists took. And Niles Eldridge, a, a famous paleontologist, the American Museum of Natural History, writes about this all the time. I'm going to be doing some joint appearances with in the future. Niles uh, you know, writes that paleontologists went out year after year seeking to confirm Darwinian transitions. And they could never do it. And they were failures. You know, and, and, and that this has been so frustrating. He says, evolution always seems to be happening somewhere else. You know, you never find it recorded in the fossils. Now, you know, of course, that when you have an army of people going out and looking for evidence to confirm a theory, they're going to find something. And so what do they find? You know, they find a couple of things like Archaeopteryx, which are chimeras. Uh, you know, they're, they're things like the duck-billed platypus, which is, it doesn't tell us anything about evolution, but it just has, you know, it's one of these strange things that has features that belong to different classes. But it, you know, it doesn't show a transition from one kind of thing to another. It's just a strange a form with different um, uh, characteristics from different uh, uh, a form. Now, um, you, uh, you get the, the, the so-called hominid series, which is mainly bone fragments. You know, it, it's said that you can put all of the evidence of human evolution on a large billiard table. Um, mostly bone fragments that are lovingly reconstructed uh, by an army of people who know very well that if they find a human ancestor, they'll be in the front page of the New York Times and they'll become rich and famous. Now, you know, this is a, you know, th this isn't something that can prove a theory. This is an artifact of belief in the theory. In fact, the fossil record overall is as anti-Darwinian as it can be, and it shows a tremendous accomplishment for the fossil record to have resisted so successfully a century of efforts of, you know, determined efforts of people to read it in Darwinian terms. Um, uh, that's what's really significant. It's not so much that there's an absence of, of evidence for the transitionals and positive documented evidence for the prevalence of stasis, that is, absence of evolutionary change over long periods of time. That's, that's, I guess that's the board, Princeton Board of Trustees. Uh, 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 that that the, you know that that the uh, uh, fossil record has so has maintained this anti-Darwinian character after such a determined effort to read you know every possible Darwinian interpretation into it. Uh, uh, that's an amazing uh, uh, thing, and I think it's it's one of the many things which is just decisively discrediting to the Darwinian system. Now, it's not necessarily discrediting to evolution in every sense. You see, uh, if, if you wanted to ask what the history of life was that's most consistent with the official interpretation accepted today of the geological column in the fossil record, it would be that new kinds of things have appeared over the history of the Earth, you say, mysteriously, by some means totally unknown to science, that seems to have the ability to produce fully formed new kinds of things out of nowhere. Now, is that what really happened? You know, or, 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 you know, is there something wrong with our interpretation? I don't know, but that would be the, the, the interpretation that's most consistent with the, the fossil evidence. And, and the reason, of course, why it's not given is because there is no mechanism for it. It's essentially a, you know, a, a, a progressive creationist uh, view. This is a big responsibility. Uh, uh, you are asking the last question, so we're expecting it to be terrific. Uh, I don't want to put you under any pressure. But. <laughs> I always say that. You know. Well, I hope it's not redundant. I'm afraid I had to. Uh, I had prior engagements, and so I'm a little late to this meeting. And you may have already addressed this issue. Um, and in fact, you kind of alluded to it in your last response. My question is: Why are evolution and creationism or Genesis necessarily mutually exclusive? Well, um, th um, there is um, nothing which is inherently mutually exclusive between evolution and creation if evolution just means a, you know, a long gradual process over time where one thing grows out to another. Another, there's no reason why a creator can't use that kind of process or any other. The reason why in our culture the two are mutually exclusive um, is the peculiar understanding of evolution that comes out of Darwinism and the scientific materialist philosophy that is its, is its foundation. All of the leading authorities of Darwinism, without exception, 
um, uh, from uh, Darwin and T.H. Huxley at the beginning down to Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Dawkins uh, today, uh, have said that the Darwinian understanding of evolution is that it is a purely materialistic process of you know, random mutations accumulated by natural selection, which is an uncaring and purposeless process, and that it, it is not a directed process. You know, it accidentally happened to produce human beings, but it wouldn't do that again, and um, it's, uh, uh, it's not directed by any intelligence. There's no uh, input from any, anything outside of the purely materialistic system. So that, for example, George Gaylord Simpson, on the leading authorities who produced the neo-Darwinian synthesis, said in his book, The Meaning of Evolution, that the meaning of evolution is that man is the product of a purposeless material mechanism that did not have him in mind. So when you're talking about unguided, purposeless, materialistic evolution, you're not talking about something that is theistic in any meaningful sense of the word. Um, now, an another way you could think about it is this, is that um, um, uh, it, 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 um, uh, uh, the uh, theory of evolution as it is understood by scientific materialists, by Darwinists today, does not prevent you from believing in God. What it prevents you from doing is saying that God had anything to do with the creative process. You see, so that as, as another leading authority, Douglas Fatuma, the author of the most widely used textbook in college courses, says that Darwin made theological or spiritual explanation of the life processes superfluous. You see, God doesn't do anything in the process. Uh, so the, the God that you're imagining is one is a very laid-back, hands-off <laughs> manager. It, it doesn't prove he doesn't exist. It, what it proves is that he might as well not exist. You see, that, 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 that he's irrelevant to the creative process and doesn't direct it, if you accept that view of evolution. So you see, the theism and the, and the material, what, what is really in, in, in contradiction is theism and materialism or naturalism. A materialism which says that matter is all there is or a, a naturalism which says essentially the same thing, nature's all there is. It's a closed system of material causes and effects that cannot be accepted, it cannot be influenced by anything from outside, is inconsistent with a theism that says that something else than um, matter exists, God, and, and that God affects the material universe and is its creator. So that's where the tension is. And I want to I say that the materialism and the naturalism is not incidental to Darwinism, it's essential. And the reason it's essential is because there's so little evidence of natural selection ever actually doing anything. You see, how do we know that natural selection, evolution by natural selection, produced these new forms that appear in the fossil record mysteriously out of nowhere? And we can't test the process. Well, what's heavily involved in, in, in that is a, is a presumption that natural selection must have done it because nothing else was available. You see, that, that's the materialism.